Good morning, everyone. It's Bob Branch from the Springs Community Church, bringing you a daily devotional from Psalm 23. We're resuming that today. I'm speaking to you from my backyard, and I'm wearing a hoodie. And the reason why I'm wearing a hoodie is not because I'm a hoodie guy, because I'm more of a quarter zip guy, but uh, because it seems like every pastor who's doing one of these things has always got to have a hoodie on, so I just want to be included. So there you go. I'm wearing a hoodie. I'm in my backyard. Um, it's kind of an overcast day, and God is good. The Lord is with you. That's one of the things that I want to be able to say to you today. The Lord is with you. We're in Psalm 23, one of the really major comforting psalms in the entire Bible, a super famous one, one that has derived uh, a lot of comfort for a lot of different people. I'm in verse 3, just at the beginning of verse 3, and I want to read to you this morning just the first three verses, and these are coming from a, a very ancient translation of the of the Old Testament into Greek. It's called the Septuagint. If you ever see the LXX after a uh, a, a reference, it's, that's referring to the Septuagint. Uh, about 200, 250 AD, I'm sorry, 250 BC, because of Alexander the Great conquering pretty much the whole known world at that point in time, he made everyone go over to the Greek language. And so at that point in time, Hebrew began to die as a language. And by the time that Jesus came on the scene, Hebrew wasn't a spoken language at all. It was considered a dead language, even though uh, scholars and different people like that actually used it. So I'm actually using the Septuagint translated into English because there's something really beautiful about that. Listen to these first three verses. This is the typically the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. It says this, the Lord tends me, T-E-N-D-S, tends me, and not one thing lacks for me. In the place of tender shoots, there he encamped me. At the water of rest, he nourished me. My life, he returned. My life, he returned. Interestingly enough, that's the, typically the, the passage that we would say, he restores my soul. But that, that word, he restores my soul, is actually a little bit of a strange word in the Hebrew and in the Greek because it's actually used overwhelmingly about someone returning from somewhere. So if someone went on a journey and they came back, they, they would use that word, return. They go back, they come back. And so they're restored to their home. So using that verse with this particular zeroing in on what that word really means, it means that God gives back our souls. Interesting. God gives back our lives. David is thinking back to when he was a shepherd in his youth. And it's no wonder that the Lord chose a shepherd to be the king of his people because a shepherd is going to look after and tend to the people of God, which is what God wants. Well, David is looking back to his days of being a shepherd, and he's thinking about how God's care has been so constant with him and how he cared about his sheep and using those two things as a corollary. And he thinks about how sheep will wander off, that sheep actually are driven by two things primarily. They're driven by their appetites and they're driven by fear. And so a sheep will actually be, be eating the, the, the bit of grass in front of them and then the next bit of grass in front of them and the next bit of grass in front of them until actually the, the flock and the shepherd are a long way off from this particular sheep. And we would call that a wayward sheep, that they're being lured away by their own, by their own appetites. I think that's relevant for us. I think that's incredibly relevant for us. But what ends up happening is if a sheep over time wanders off from the shepherd and from the flock too many times, the shepherd will actually have to take drastic measures because he knows that the sheep is putting themselves in danger every time that they do this. And so he will, the drastic measure goes like this, and we learn this from Philip Keller in his book, A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. He said that a shepherd will come to that, that wandering off sheep and he will actually break one of its legs intentionally. And then he will put the sheep over his, over his shoulders and he will carry that sheep, nurturing the leg back and nurturing the relationship with the sheep and shepherd back again until those things are strong and the sheep will no longer wander off because of the relationship with the shepherd. Now, as I think of David in this, I think, okay, David knows a lot of times where he's had to be restored by God where he's had to return back and he's had to have God return his soul back to the Lord. As I think about this, he had lots of times where he had to be brought back home to God. 
Remember, David was a fugitive and he was a hunted man for a good amount of time. Then on top of that, after he becomes king, he commits adultery with a woman, uh, conceives a, a child with her, has her husband killed in the front line. So he actually is technically a murderer. And so this guy needs some he needs some restoring. He needs some coming back home. He's he and he loses his son, who he is conceived with her, and that breaks his heart as well. He needs to come back home with that. He lives among the enemy and behind enemy lines, and among the enemy actually acts like he's insane. He's an insane person while he's doing that, and and he's doing that. It needs to be restored back to the Lord from all of those shenanigans. His boss, King Saul, tries to kill him not one but numerous times. Is trying to kill him. He's alone. He's an outcast. Then after he becomes king as well, Absalom, his his one of his sons actually usurps the throne, creates a mutiny. David flees in that whole thing. He has to be restored back again in that. David, at one point in time, decides that he's going to to take a census in a very presumptuous way and comes under the discipline of God. Again, he needs to be restored from that. At another time, he dances before the ark of God, but doesn't really consult the Lord in terms of what are actually the ways that we should handle the ark of God. And so as a result of that, somebody gets somebody loses their life over that thing. Again, David needs to be restored. David wants to build a house for God, but gets vetoed, line item vetoed by God in that whole thing. He sometimes he sides with the wrong group of people. His family is a train wreck. This guy knows what it's like to be restored. And so he knows that he's had to be returned to God himself over and over again. He's had to come home to God. He's needed restoring. He's been disintegrated and needs to be reintegrated as a person. And each time, just beautifully, that God actually is so generous and actually restores him. I mean, that's just an, an unbelievable fact that our God is just that generous with us, that he restores us, he welcomes us, he brings us home. And I can't think of this idea of coming home, of being restored, of being on a long journey or being lost and being returned. I can't think of that without thinking of the story that Jesus tells in Luke 15 about the prodigal or the lost son. And in that story, that son out of his own you know, of his own volition, he leaves the father, he takes his inheritance, he goes and loses it all in a wild living. Finally, he's lost everything. He's living with the pigs. He's living with the pigs. I mean, for a Jewish person, this is like, oh no, are you kidding me? Living with the pigs? That's as low as low can possibly be. That's being underneath the jail. That's not just being in jail for them. And he is, he comes back home and the father welcomes him. He's restored to his father. He's restored to his family. He's restored to his inheritance. I mean, what an incredibly unbelievable portrait of this idea of restoration. He, he says, and I think out of that, the Lord says to us, come home, come all the way home. Now, another dimension of this, and I've been reflecting on this for the last week or so, because this word kind of haunts me in a beautiful way, that if, if, if God is restoring us, that is bringing us back, that he is literally giving me back to me. Now, that is, he restores our humanity. He transforms you and me into the very best versions of ourselves. He's not trying to get you to be somebody else. He's trying to get you to be the, the version of you that he has in his mind when he made you. He wants to give you back your full humanity, not take it from you, but it's the humanity that he has in mind when he made you. It's not just any random kind of, uh, of, of an, an image that you want to kind of move yourself into or away from. And so he reintegrates us back into who he wants us to be rather than what the world says. He integrates us back into who he wants to be regardless of what our past or our mistakes or our brokenness would say. He reintegrates us no matter what the enemy's lies would say to us. He reintegrates us no matter if we have these immature concoctions of the greatest possible me, the, the I've got to be me or any of that kind of stuff, that the Lord reintegrates us in a beautiful and a generous way. I love the way that author Ian Morgan Cron, you, he, he entitles it in his book, The Road Back to You. I love the title because there's this idea, it's a book about the Enneagram and how God has made each one of us in a beautifully unique way. And that God doesn't want us to be somebody else, he wants us to be 
us and the way that he has made us. I mean, that's just an unbelievably beautiful concept that the Lord says, I want to bring you home to you. I want you to bring you home to your true humanity, the true you in Christ, the true you in union with Father, Son, and Spirit, the you that's integrated, the, the whole you, the full you, the filled you. That's the restoration, the complete you in Christ. This is, this is just this is awesome stuff. Now, just to summarize this, there's a lot to think about here. You've got, you know, you've got David and, and you've got this whole idea of returning all the way home and that God returns us all the way home. You have David and all of his craziness of his life. He's being returned home and he, he comes all the way home. You have the prodigal son returning home and being completely restored. You have God restoring your true humanity. And all of this stuff is this is all the work of Jesus. This is what we would call the presence of the future. It is that heavenly thing that's, that's going to happen in completeness in heaven. It's now invaded the now and now begins to transform you and I. The future has invaded the present. And so now we are living in the kingdom of God in the presence of the future. And that's happening. It's going on right now, not at a theater near you, but in a heart right inside of your body. If you know Jesus, that's happening in you right now. That's your inheritance. And Jesus is integrating you, bringing you back to you. He is actually giving you back to you. So I love that it, the uh, verse, that the way that the Apostle Paul lands the plane, he finishes up 2 Corinthians, and he does it in such a beautiful way. He typically will summarize a bunch of things that he wants them to focus on, and here's what he says in 2 Corinthians 13, 11. He says it this way, strive for full restoration. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of peace and love will be with you. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. I want to pray for you right now, just for a moment as we finish. And I'm going to take just a moment and be quiet because I believe that the Lord wants to speak as I'm praying. And then I'm going to pray for you and then we'll close out. Father, let your spirit come and rest on everyone who's listening in, no matter if it's presently or a long time down the road. Let your spirit rest on them. I believe that there are several people listening in, Lord, that are actually have caught some problems swallowing and some problems uh, with their, this is bizarre, but with their taste buds. And I ask you, Lord, that you would bring your healing power into them now. I pray, Lord, for those who are experiencing headaches in both temples right now, I pray that those headaches would leave. More than anything else, Lord, I pray that this returning dynamic would be now cinched down into our souls, that it would not leave us alone, that you would continue to remind us, hey, I'm bringing you back to me. I'm bringing you back to you. I'm bringing you back to others. I ask you, Lord, that you would continue to remind us, not hound us, but that you would remind us and that you're with us, that the Lord is with you. Thank you, Lord, for this time we've had together. I pray that you would bless each person listening in, in Jesus' name.